Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. This is a, another seminar uh, from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia. And uh, today we will have the talk by Dr. Carolina Casadio from the Institute of Astrophysics in uh, Crete, in, in Greece. And she will talk about search for millilens to discriminate between dark matter models. <clears throat> Carolina, uh, she, she focused uh, her research career today and uh, she has been uh, in, in relativistic jets in galactic nuclei. And they start in very long baseline interferometry and multi-wavelength polarimetric data. She obtained the PhD here in Granada, in Spain, at, the, at, at our institute, in Instituto Astrofisica Andalusia in 2016, under the supervision by Dr. José Luis Gómez and Dr. Ivan Agudo. And after that, after the PhD, she moved to the BLBI group of the Max Planck Institute in Radio Astronomy in Bonn, in Germany, for her first postdoctoral appointment where she shift the attention to uh, millimeter BLBI radio data. Then at the beginning of 2020, she moved to Crete in Greece to join the research group led by Professor Basiliki Pablidou and uh, Kostas Tassis at the Institute of Astrophysics there. Uh, there, she added uh, one more piece of information to uh, her studies, including the dark matter and the leading group of undergraduate students and PhD researchers for the pilot project of SMILE program that she will be uh, presented today. So thank you very much, Carolina, for being here. And uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, so as you just heard, the uh, I'm a radio astronomer, and my my background is uh, actually focused on relativistic jet in active galaxies, mostly using a, a very long baseline interferometry, and that's why today I will give you a talk on uh, dark matter models. So yes, it's uh, yeah. I hope you are laughing behind your screen. It is a bit awkward to have this online, but uh, this was partially a joke actually, uh, um, but partially not, uh, because I will really give you a talk about this uh, um, recently started project uh, called the SMILE, uh, that we recently started with some collaborators, some of them are named uh, here in the presentation. Uh, SMILE stays for search for mini lenses, uh, and in this project we use the gravitational lensing on the um, key but poorly explored the milliard seconds case to discriminate between dark matter model. And I will show you now how uh, also uh, VLBI and AGN physics have fortunately something to do with this project. So let's start with this um, nice plot that tells us how few we know about our universe. Uh, it is now known that the roughly the 95% of the total energy content of the universe is made of unknown forms of matter and energy. And in the uh, standard cosmological model, this matter is in the form of cold dark matter, therefore the lambda CDM model, uh, where particles are non-relativistic at their origin and they are collisionless. But um, because of the elusive detection of these uh, of the dark matter particles on one side, and uh, um, because of the remaining discrepancies between uh, um, lambda CDM predictions and observation at some scales um, on the other side, then uh, there are still many viable uh, dark matter models on the, on the table of discussion. And actually some of them have been thought exactly to solve some of the issue uh, of the lambda CDM model. Um, here I named just some of them. Uh, this doesn't pretend to be a review on dark matter models, so I probably name the uh, most cited in literature. So, for example, the self-interacting dark matter model, where particles are still called dark matter particles, but they uh, scatter elastically be between each other. 
And then we have uh, the fuzzy cold dark matter model um, where particle, cold dark matter particles are ultra light. Uh, and then the, the, the famous also warm dark matter model where particles are, for example, semi-relativistic at their origin. But dark matter uh, doesn't have to be necessarily a particle. There are in fact also non-particle candidates, like for example, primordial black holes. Uh, these objects, uh, uh, depending on the epoch of uh, formation, they may have a very different masses. And actually, there was a renewed in interest uh, on this object uh, um, associated to the recent detection of the gravitational wave signal from emerging of uh, two black holes, where the primary black hole is, uh, has a mass of uh, around 85 solar masses. And, and this has rise and doubt on, the, on its stellar origin. So, um, as I mentioned before, the lambda CDM model is, a, a very, is very successful in uh, uh, predicting the formation of large scale structure in the universe, but it still has some issues and mostly at the smaller scales. For example, at subgalactic scales, so we're talking about masses below 10, 10, into 10, 10, into the 10 into 10 solar masses scales. Um, the, it predicts, for example, a number of dark matter halos uh, that is uh, far above the observed number. And this is what you have in this plot, for example, where you have uh, the, that the curve are the, uh, represent the prediction from the uh, lambda CDM model, while instead the triangles are the satellite galaxies in our Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy. But not only the number, the predicted number is different from uh, observation. Also, it seems that, that they also have uh, different density profiles uh, than uh, uh, what is predicted by Lambda CDM. In this plot, for example, you have uh, the density profiles on a large, uh, of a large number of uh, uh, dwarf galaxies from uh, the Little Things survey in uh, uh, O et al. 2015. Uh, that are represented by these uh, green points. And as you see, this uh, green point, so in the central region of the of dark matter halos, uh, they are uh, rising more slowly than the gray curves that instead represent the prediction from the CDM and navarro franke white density profiles that predicted the formation of a high density uh, cusp in the central region of dark matter halos. While instead, the, uh, these, uh, the observation of these uh, uh, dwarf galaxies point more toward the formation of a core-like uh, center. And for this reason, sometimes this problem is addressed as the core cusp uh, problem. And it is at this subgalactic scales uh, where different dark matter models make very different prediction uh, indeed, here you have uh, the power spectrum of baryonic acoustic oscillations at different uh, masses and different scales. The gray shade area is uh, uh, highlighting exactly these uh, subgalactic scales, and the blue curves uh, are uh, for different uh, dark matter models. So let's, for example, uh, uh, consider the blue solid line that is the cold dark matter model, and instead of the dashed line uh, that is the warm dark matter model. If you see, the, uh, the warm dark matter model has a cutoff around 10 to the 8 uh, solar masses, while the cold dark matter model stays, uh, stays up. And this is, for example, is telling us that uh, in the warm, if the warm dark matter model is uh, correct, then we, we don't expect to observe uh, um, dark matter halos below a certain mass below around the 10 to the 8 solar masses. Uh, so let me say that in general, uh, different dark matter models make very different prediction on the expected number of dark matter halos at subgalactic scales, and as well as uh, uh, about their density profiles. And this leads to the natural conclusion that um, estimating the number of dark matter subgalactic halos is very important, and it can help uh, discerning the nature of dark matter. So then why nobody has been done this before? Why nobody has been uh, uh, tightening this, this number? 
So mostly because dark matter subgalactic halos are very hard to detect. Here on the right, you have a, a nice picture uh, with uh, um, uh, dwarf galaxies uh, uh, spanning six order of uh, magnitude in, in, uh, in stellar masses. So from the most massive and uh, brightest one on the uh, top left to the um, less massive and faintest one at the bottom right. So for these last ones, for example, uh, we can only detect them in a volume nearby the Milky Way. So this, this picture is already showing us how difficult it is to detect them uh, using optical observations. And uh, um, so it, this is because the dark matter halos at subgalactic scales, uh, being smaller and being more dark matter dominated, they are extremely faint. And this is for those dark matter halos, at least for galaxies, because below some intent to the eight solar masses, we don't even expect dark matter halos to form galaxies. Therefore, they are dark. And the only way we have to, to detect them is through the gravitational effect that uh, they exert on ordinary matter, therefore using gravitational lensing. But for a dark matter halos, in order to, um, to make strong lensing on a background source, uh, it has to have, it has to be dense enough. So it has to have a density above a certain threshold. In this plot here, so in this study of uh, Wong et al and collaborator in 2020, they, they have studied in details the concentration of uh, uh, simulated dark matter halos. Uh, and, and they plotted here the concentration uh, in function of, of their masses. And as you can see, basically, uh, dark matter halos at subgalactic scales, so they are far more concentrated than, for example, galaxy cluster dark matter halos. So this is telling us that um, from prediction, we should expect at least the cores of these dark matter halos at subgalactic scales so to be dense enough in order to make, uh, to make strong lensing. And so because of their high concentration and small masses, these dark matter halos at subgalactic scales, uh, we can approximate them with uh, uh, point mass lenses. And we know from the gravitational lensing theory that a point mass lens uh, should produce, uh, should split the image of a background source into two lensed images whose angular separation, if the lens and the source are at uh, uh, cosmological distances and for order of magnitude precision, it should depend only on the mass of the lens. So if we consider a supermass, a, a compact object of, uh, uh, of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9 solar masses, so I will call from now on this type of object a supermass and compact object, then we expect the angular separation between uh, the lens images to be in the milliard second regime. And that's why we call this type of gravitational lensing system milli lenses. So as I just said, basically um, the, uh, the direct observable of milli lensing are supermassive compact objects which are dense enough in order to make strong lensing on background sources. And this translate basically into these conditions. So they have to have a surface mass density above a certain threshold, that is this one. And astrophysical objects uh, that satisfy this condition can be, as I just mentioned, the cores of subgalactic dark matter halos that they can live in the surrounding of galactic halos or free floating in the field. But there are also other astrophysical objects that can satisfy this condition as, for example, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies like the one in active galaxies, for example, or in the outskirts of galaxies. And also primordial black holes that, as I mentioned before, they are considered by certain uh, model uh, a major component of the dark matter. Um, until now, the search for this uh, dark matter areas at subgalactic scales has been addressed mostly using what I will call uh, uh, indirect uh, observational method. I will explain you later why I call uh, them like that. So one of them is uh, um, 
makes use uh, still of gravitational lensing, but this time at galactic scales. So it means that here the lens is a, a galaxy with, uh, with its own dark matter halos. And we, we can usually have this type of, uh, these two types of scenario here. So scenario A and scenario B. In the scenario A, uh, we have that the, the background source uh, is an extended source, uh, as it could be another galaxy, for example, or a radio loud quasar where we can uh, resolve the jet. And in this case, uh, the, we usually have the formation of arc-like structures. And uh, in some cases, we can even have the, the formation of a complete Einstein rings. The case B instead is when you have uh, 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 the, the source in the background is a compact source, as it could be, for example, uh, a quasar at, uh, at optical frequency or a radio compact quasar. Uh, and in this case, we have instead the formation of a multiple compact components. That is what we also have in, uh, in the case of mini lensing, but in this case, we are at larger angular scales because the lens is a, is a galaxy. So usually here, angular scales are of the order of the uh, arc second or a couple of arc second. So, and since in gravitational lensing, the positions as well as the magnifications of these lens images uh, depends on the distribution of the, uh, of the lens mass distributions, then basically any anomaly, uh, any anomaly on these uh, uh, physical quantities uh, can indicate the existence of an extra mass contributing to the gravitational potential of the lens. And this extra mass can be in the surrounding of the galaxies or in the, in the path in between the source and the, and the observer. Then another method uh, is uh, using density perturbation in the uh, Milky Way stellar streams, where uh, these stellar streams are basically formed by stars that are escaping uh, disrupting globular clusters. Uh, in this case, basically, so the, uh, if, if this stellar stream uh, is encountering um, a mass condensate, as it could be a dark matter uh, subgalactic halos, for example, uh, then these can, uh, can introduce some perturbation in the density of this stellar stream. However, this, uh, uh, the, basically the um, uncertainty or the difficulty in this, uh, this method is that uh, you need to know very well what are the intrinsic properties of this stellar stream in order to exclude that this density perturbation are not intrinsic uh, uh, instead of given by a, a gravitational lensing event. Then the third method uh, still uses uh, uh, gravitational lensing, but this time in the time domain uh, and using uh, GRB, uh, gamma ray burst. Uh, in principle, using this method, uh, it's possible to distinguish uh, compact objects with uh, masses between 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 7 solar masses. And one example is this one, for example, GRB uh, 210812A. Uh, in this paper of Perez uh, and collaborators 2021, they basically using the, the two peak of the emission and the time delay, as well as the flux ratios of these two peak, uh, they were able to infer the mass of the lens that should uh, produce this, uh, um, this gravitational lensing event. Um, so I, I call this method uh, indirect observational uh, method because um, in, in all this method, you basically, it's difficult to be 100% sure uh, that what you are uh, observing, so either the anomaly on this uh, or this uh, uh, double peak in the GRB, is not something uh, intrinsic uh, more than uh, associated to a gravitational lensing event. And uh, so, if you want instead to use a more direct method, so I mean uh, really imaging the, the two lens images at angular scales that we expect to be produced by a, a supermassive compact object, then you obviously need a millier second resolution. And the, uh, the, the most direct way nowadays to, to reach this high resolution is using very long baseline interferometry. Um, in this technique, um, antennas are uh, 
um, the, the observation are performed in conjunction by antenna located in different places around the world. Uh, and effectively using basically the, the entire Earth surface as, it, as if it was one unique antenna. Here I only mention uh, the two main VLBI arrays in the Northern Hemisphere because it, they are the one I'm interested in. Um, and they are the uh, European VLBI networks uh, with antennas located in uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and one in South Africa and the very long baseline array with most of the antenna located in the North America. So then we, uh, we have performed a pilot search for these mini lenses using the, uh, the publicly available data in the AstroGeo VLBI FITS image database. Um, this database contains mostly um, uh, VLBI data of uh, um, radio compact uh, sources at uh, multiple frequency and multiple epochs, uh, because the goal of this database is uh, to, um, to uh, obtain a radio fundamental catalog. Um, so at the time we performed this search, we uh, downloaded visibility data, uh, multi-epoch and uh, uh, multi-frequency for the, the available sources at that time that were almost 14,000 sources. We perform a stacking of the uh, of the images for those sources where multiple epochs were available, and we finally um, create a web page uh, based on the idea of the citizen science project um, to uh, visually inspect all these images. Then we have involved five PhD scientists and nine undergraduate physics students from the University of Crete in this search, and. Uh, we have asked them to, uh, to mark as uh, uh, lenses uh, sources where multiple compact components were present in at least one of the observing band, as the example you have uh, on, the, uh, on the left, uh, and instead to possibly mark as uh, no lens sources where uh, it was possible to clearly distinguish a jet-like structure. Um, as a sort of a quality check, because uh, uh, people, many people were not expert in uh, either the uh, Asian physics or, 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 or gravitational lensing or, or either uh, uh, VLBI, um, then we, um, we have created these uh, uh, 200 mock lenses uh, faking the emission of a secondary uh, component, compact component, and placing it uh, in, uh, in any position within the field of view. Uh, as you have in this, uh, in, the, in this example here at the bottom. And um, so at the end of this uh, first uh, visual inspection step, uh, we, uh, we found that uh, eight lenses, eight mock lenses were, were missed, but fortunately six of them were missed by, by two persons together. So then basically we have inspected the, the uh, sources that have been expected by these two persons that were roughly a thousand. And we were finally then able to assess a loss rate in this uh, uh, first visual inspection step of uh, uh, 1%. Uh, plus we found also four more lens candidates. And so the number of uh, lens candidates at the end of this uh, first uh, step was 954. So then we, um, we did uh, two more uh, steps of visual inspection, but this time uh, more expert people in either um, the agent physics or the uh, milli lensing were, were involved. And then at the end of all this step of visual inspection, we ended up with 59 candidates. Then as a last step, we filter the sources using the surface brightness preservation criterion. Um, so in gravitational lensing, we expect uh, the, uh, some physical quantity uh, being preserved. And, and one of these quantity is the surface brightness of the, the different lensed image, the supposed lensed images. So, and this means that uh, a secondary uh, fainter component has to be smaller than the prim primary brightest component. And then we use uh, this uh, upper and surface brightness ratio between component lower than sever to, um, to finally uh, obtain the, uh, the list of the 40 best uh, candidates. And uh, 
we uh, we published this list in uh, this uh, um, in this letter uh, recently published in monthly notice. Um, so these, uh, there you can find the list of these uh, 40 best uh, candidates. And uh, just as a reminder, all these uh, 40 sources have multiple compact component in at least one observing band and an upper and surface brightness ratio uh, between components lower than seven. Then also based on uh, uh, spectral index information, we suggested uh, two sources uh, that have a high probability of uh, being a millilens system. And so why, uh, why this, uh, why this, basically, why the, the spectral index information is important? So, um, first of all, the fact that they are similar. So, the, as I just mentioned, so gravitational lensing uh, is, is an achromatic effect and is supposed to maintain some, some physical quantities between the, the lensed images. Um, like, for example, the surface brightness or the flux density ratio between the between components or the, the spectral indexes uh, between components. Um, moreover, the, uh, the light rays uh, um, that produce the, the, uh, the lensed images um, have different paths. Uh, and this introduces a time delay between the lensed images. But since this time delay depends linearly on the angular separation of the lensed images, and in milli lenses, we are at angular separation of milliard second scales, uh, then this means that uh, time delays in, uh, in milli lenses uh, are very small. Usually we are talking about uh, time delays of the order of tens of second or some hour, usually uh, in any case, uh, smaller than a day. And this is important because it means that uh, time delays in milli lensing are not affecting either flux density ratio nor spectral index measurement. However, in the case of uh, spectral index, uh, we cannot exclude the fact that uh, the two light rays um, that are crossing different plasma, uh, they may cross plasma with different absorption coefficient and therefore this lead to, the, it may lead to different spectral indexes uh, uh, for the two uh, components, for the, for the two lens images. Um, and so for this reason, basically, we use the, uh, the spectral index only as a suggestion in this case and not as a constraint. Then the fact that they are uh, also flat, the, the spectral indexes of the, of the two components uh, is also important. So here you have a famous uh, um, gravitational lens system, um, but at galactic scales. So where the, uh, in this case, the the lens is a, is a galaxy, this G1 plus another dwarf galaxy, and they are um, splitting then the image of a compact uh, radio loud quasar in the background into these four images. But since we know that the bulk of the mission in a compact radio loud quasar uh, comes from the core region, and we know that the core region has a flat spectrum, then aside from the fact of having similar spectral indexes, we also expect them to have uh, to be flat, as is exactly in this case, in this uh, gravitational lens system. And this, for example, may help to, to distinguish between uh, other cases where we can have a similar morphology, so we can still have a core and maybe a secondary component. This time, uh, though the secondary component belongs to the jet, uh, and in this case, uh, we expect this component having a, a, a different, uh, different uh, spectrum uh, and also steeper, usually. But so let's say that in general, the, uh, the step that we need uh, to, to perform in order to confirm uh, a mini lens system are the following one. So we have to, so, so far we have inspected the VLBI images and we have uh, selected the sources with multiple compact components on linear second scales. Uh, we have compared the surface, the apparent surface brightness of these components and we have uh, uh, discarded the one that have no similar surface, uh, apparent surface brightnesses. 
Um, and then for this, uh, uh, this first step, we only used uh, um, spectral indexes as a suggestion for the two most uh, probable millilens candidates. Um, but then the, so now we need basically more follow-up uh, observation and we, we actually obtain a new EVN observation at five and 22 gigahertz. Uh, that we will use uh, basically to, to repeat uh, this uh, and, uh, and then with, with more information in our hand, uh, we will also uh, be able, for example, to use the flux ratios and the spectral index uh, with, with more confidence to finally obtain the, um, the, the most probable, uh, this time a millilens candidate, uh, that we will uh, then use to, per, to, to test them with, uh, uh, with the lens modeling to finally basically see if uh, the, uh, their flux ratios and position are in agreement with, uh, uh, with the lens model. In any case, all sources uh, that will be finally discarded as a millilens system, uh, because of their morphology, they can still investigate it as a compact symmetric object or, super, or even supermassive binary black hole candidates. So in the case of compact symmetric object, uh, um, the, uh, they, they are thought to be the young counterparts of, of the uh, currently extended radio galaxies. And in this case, the emission comes from these two, from the hotspot at the end of these two lobes where the, um, the plasma, the jet plasma is interacting with the interstellar medium. And in most of the cases here, the core is obscured. And that's why this morphology resembles a lot the morphology we expected in, in millilenses system. And then here on the right, you have instead the uh, multi-frequency VLDA observation of the only uh, supermassive binary black hole confirmed morphologically. And, uh, uh, and this is interesting because we expect, we would expect to see many more um, if, if we are based, I mean, based on the uh, hierarchical merging um, theory and the fact that most of the uh, galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center. So the, as I mentioned before, we, we have asked and obtained uh, EVN time uh, for the follow-up of our 40 uh, millilens candidate uh, that uh, have, have been performed with uh, uh, observation at five and 22 gigahertz in phase referencing for a total of 140 hours uh, split it in five observing sessions. Since the analysis of this data is still undergoing, I will just show you some, uh, uh, some example. So one interesting source is this one, 05, uh, uh, 27 plus 1743. In our new uh, EVN 5 gigahertz observation, uh, it confirms the, this uh, uh, double compact feature structure. Um, and we are also able in our new observation to discard the third component that we were observing in, in the AstroGeo image as a, as, as a probable artifact. Um, the, the two components still respect uh, the, the surface brightness criterion. But when we measure, for example, the flux ratios uh, of the uh, two components at the closest frequency, we see some discrepancies. So then this means that most probably this is not a millilens system, but obviously we will need more analysis and also the 22 gigahertz information to, to confirm this. Another interesting source is this one, J0237. This source uh, is uh, showing uh, a different morphology in our new EVN 5 gigahertz observation. And we think that here what plays a role uh, is the, uh, the variability of this source. So probably in the AstroGeo epoch, it was ejecting a secondary component, uh, while in this new observation, uh, it just shows a more simple core jet-like structure. And in support of this scenario is also the uh, position, the astromatic position of the optical emission as given by Gaia that uh, is closer to the core and not in between the two compact components as we would expect if this was a gravitational lens system. Then the last one is this, uh, so J1143 plus 1834. Um, this source is interesting because we were able so also to recover the 22 gigahertz emission from both compact features. 
I'm afraid I cannot tell you more because of the analysis is still undergoing. Uh, but in any case, even if uh, we will discard this source as a millilens system, uh, it's still a very interesting, this one is still a very interesting source that was uh, um, associated, that was, uh, was classified as a CSO candidate or even a supermassive black hole, a binary black hole candidate in, uh, in previous uh, studies. So what I presented um, to you so far is uh, the uh, was a pilot project for uh, a more extended uh, project, the, the Smile project, a more extent that we we uh, we plan to perform using the uh, DLBI data of uh, roughly five thousand radio loud sources. Uh, more extended in the sense that uh, in this case uh, we will take care of data from scratch, so also from the calibration. Um, a radio astronomer knows how, know how this uh, is, a, is a very time consuming uh, task. Um, and, and so now I will tell you the, basically the idea. So the idea behind this project comes from uh, these two pioneering studies. Uh, so Press and Gunn in 1973 first developed the idea that the number of gravitational lensing event um, by supermassive compact objects directly probes uh, the mass density, therefore the abundance of supermassive compact objects in the universe. And then later on, Wilkinson et al. in 2001 used this idea to uh, constrain this abundance for supermassive compact objects with masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 8 solar masses uh, using a smaller sample than what we plan to, to do in our SMILE project. So using a sample of 300 sources and the LBI data. And this is the constraint here, this one, that they obtain with no millilens uh, found. With our project, instead, uh, we plan to constrain the abundance of supermassive compact objects with masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar masses uh, with more than an order of magnitude better precision than in Wilkinson et al. 2001. In this plot here, you have the density of the universe locked up in an object of a certain mass versus that mass. And as you can see, uh, the constraint we will obtain with our project will be below the lambda CDM prediction, while this was not the case uh, for the constraint in Wilkinson et al. 2001. So then basically our goal, as I just said, is uh, to, um, to constrain the abundance of supermassive compact objects in the universe with roughly 60, 16 times better precision than in previous studies. And in order to do that, then we have to move to a sample that is roughly 16 times larger than, than in previous studies. So therefore, we have collected the, um, a sample of almost 5,000 sources using the, um, the original uh, catalog from the, uh, from the class survey, being a class, the, the most successful to date uh, um, search for a gravitational lens system on galactic scales and using radio frequency. So we have done then use basically the class catalog, and then we have selected the uh, sources with the flux density at eight gigahertz, uh, higher than 50 millijanski. And in this way, we ended up with a complete sample of 5,000 sources. So then we have cross match these uh, because we want to have a new uh, BLBI data, or to have BLBI data of these sources. And so we, we cross match we cross match this list with, uh, with the archive and we find that 75% uh, 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 of, of the data, of our data, uh, of the data for this project uh, are already uh, collected in the archive. Uh, so then we propose the for data for the remaining sources and we obtain observations. So the 25% of, uh, of data instead in, from the SMI sample comes from newly obtained observation. So, um, since we are interested in um, so the, the, uh, the direct observable of our SMILE project uh, will be the abundance of this supermassive compact object. But since we are interested in a particular type of supermassive compact object that are these dark matter halos, the subgalactic scales, then what we want really to know is what is the number of these dark matter halos that we are able to detect uh, through millilensing. And this depends on the uh, on how dense, as I said at the beginning, are these dark matter halos and on the mass function of these dark matter halos. 
And both these quantities are obviously set by dark matter particle properties. Then it also, this number also depends obviously on the, on the experiment, mostly on the size of the sample. And SMILE will, will have the largest sample ever for this type of search. So then in order to compute this number, uh, we, we have used the optical depth of, of each source in our sample. Uh, we have computed this optical depth, where the op this optical depth is basically the probability uh, that uh, a source has to be lensed by an object uh, in, uh, along its path, so in between the source and the observer. And this um, optical depth, this quantity, depends on the uh, redshift of the source, and for we have information, uh, redshift information for uh, two thirds of the sources in our in the SMILE sample. For the remaining one, th one third, instead we assume a similar uh, redshift distribution. It also depends on this the number density of the supposed lens population that in this case are our dark matter halos. And, uh, and this, as I just said, uh, then this parameter here will depend on the density profile and the, and the mass function. So then this quantity here is the, the, the one that is different for different dark matter models. Then this quantity also depends on the uh, lensing cross-section that in turn depends on the lens of the, of the mass of the lens and the uh, redshift of the lens on, and the source. And then finally, it also depends on the, on the uh, uh, lens path uh, that in turn depends on the cosmology used and the uh, redshift of the source. So basically then once we have computed this optical depth for each one of the source in our sample, then we just have to sum over all the sources and we will obtain, we, we have obtained the, uh, the number of expected dark matter halos that we will detect through mini lensing with our SMILE project. And this is what exactly what I show you here. So we have computed this number for different dark matter uh, models. So here you have the number we expect uh, in the case of warm dark matter or the warm dark matter model, this one here, that is zero because of the cutoff that I show you at the, at the beginning. Um, then we have com computed this number for uh, three different cold dark matter model uh, that have different density profiles. So in two of them, the density profiles comes from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, theoretical prediction and simulation. In particular, we have this one that is uh, the Navarro Franklin White density profile, and in this one is the this one is the density profile associated to core collapse or self-interacting dark matter model. And then the third model, instead, uh, for the third model, we have uh, um, used density profiles derived from uh, observations of galaxy cluster. And the important thing here is that, as you can see. Uh, different dark matter models will give us give us a very different number of expected dark matter halos that we can detect through milli lensing in our in our smile sample and so this basically means that the smile will allow us to robustly discard some dark matter models while this for example was not the case in previous studies just because of the size of the sample in fact if uh, uh, so considering that the the um, the, the two sample in, in, uh, in our project, SMILE, and in uh, Wilkinson et al. 2001 have uh, the, uh, a similar ratio distribution, then we can use basically this formula here to infer exactly this number for the different dark matter models in the case of the, the study of Wilkinson et al. And uh, that we can compute uh, um, using this, uh, the, the number in SMILE and this uh, factor here. And so basically this, uh, this gives us zero for, for all the dark matter models. So less than one. So it means that uh, Wilkinson, uh, the, because of the sample size, uh, the, uh, the constraint in uh, Wilkinson et al. 2001 was not able to distinguish between these two, with these different dark matter models. So and here I reach my, uh, my summary. Um, so just as a, uh, to remind you what uh, I've been presenting. So uh, we presented the pilot search uh, for gravitational lenses with uh, uh, angular scale, with uh, millisecond uh, angular separation. 
uh, and for this we use uh, VLBI data in the uh, of almost 14,000 sources uh, from the publicly available uh, um, catalog in the, the AstroGeo VLBI FITS image database. Uh, the direct observable of family lensing are supermassive compact objects uh, such as dark matter subgalactic halos or even primordial black holes or supermassive black holes that we can find in the center of galaxies. Uh, so then we found uh, uh, in this pilot search 40 mini lens candidates uh, that have multiple compact components in at least one observing band and an upper and surface brightness ratio between components lower than seven. So then we followed up the 40 candidates with uh, uh, EVM, a new EVM uh, observation at 5 and 22 gigahertz, and the data are still under analysis. So I've just presented you some uh, preliminary data, some example. And um, so sources that will, uh, uh, will be finally discarded as gravitational lens uh, system can be still investigated as a compact symmetric object or even a supermassive binary black holes. And then finally, we, we are planning, uh, if uh, we are currently looking for funding, so if funding, we are planning to extend this project uh, and to perform a similar search on a complete sample of uh, uh, almost 5,000 radio loud sources to obtain a new constraint on the abundance of supermassive compact objects with masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar masses. And we will obtain a constraint that is a uh, more than order of magnitude uh, um, with more than an order of magnitude better precision than in previous studies. And this will allow us to discard some currently viable dark matter models. So thanks. Thank you very much, Carolina, for this uh, talk. And now the talk is so open for uh, questions. Please, if you want to do a question to Carolina, raise your hand, your electronic hand and I will let you open your micro. So questions. Okay, uh, Rainer, please, go on. Uh, not really any big questions, it was fantastic. I just want to say that I'm very impressed. I really like your talk, Carolina, very, very good work very clearly presented. Um, the only thing I think maybe this concentration parameter at the very beginning, the second or third slide, I didn't understand what it was and why the smaller ones are more concentrated than the larger ones. Yeah, this one. This one. I didn't understand this graphic. Uh, yeah, um, these are results from um, so it's from a um, simulated the dark matter halos. So they have computed this. Uh, so the, the concentration is a, is a parameter for the density of these uh, dark matter halos. And yeah, and, and they have, so then they have computed this concentration for different uh, uh, dark matter halos masses. But are what are the X and the Y axis? So, I mean, the larger the number, the more concentrated, I guess, on the Y axis. And what is the X axis? Yes, the masses. So this uh, M200 is usually 200, the, the virial, uh, so it's, ah, it's considered okay. virial mass. The, okay. Yes, in, in unit of, of solar masses. So 10 to the 15 is, uh, is usually the, uh, the, the virial mass for a, uh, uh, galaxy cluster dark matter halos. We are, we are around that, that values. And then uh, if we talk about subgalactic dark matter halos, we are something like in this orange and uh, line uh, below. So something. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rainer. Uh, Jose Diego, have a question, please. Go on. Um, thank you, Carolina. Really nice talk. So you mentioned earlier that the surface brightness is used to discriminate between good and bad candidates. But um, most of the images you saw, your images are unresolved. And in this case, how do you factor in the fact that you have some kind of PSF uh, convolving your image? 
Um, yeah, the, the surface brightness, um, the the value that I compute are not from the image uh, plane, but I usually uh, model fit the, um, the the visibility data, and and then from the model fit component uh, that uh, so doing like that you shouldn't be affected, for example, by the beam. Um, then from the model fit component, uh, I extract the basically the, the the size of the emitting component and the flux, and I compute it to the I compute the surface brightness then value. Okay, thanks. Thank you. More questions, Carolina. Okay, I do not see any more questions, so maybe we can close the talk. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, wonderful talk and uh, see you in the next uh, seminar. The talk will be uploaded to our communication channel, so you can follow on this uh, subject there. Thank you very much, Carolina. Thanks, thanks to all of you.